It is officially election season. Get geared up over at StuDoesMerch.com. We've got everything from anyone but Biden 2024 to repeal the 16th Amendment. You can use the promo code Stu10 to get 10% off your order. Don't forget to support us on YouTube as well. We appreciate that, uh, at least while they leave us on there. I mean, for the moment, we're there. So go there, youtube.com slash America. We've got a great new video uh, coming up tomorrow around noon that you're going to uh, like quite a bit. It's got a little bit of something to do with Joe and Hunter Biden. Leave it at that for now. Comedian Jeff Allen is going to be here to talk about turning your life around, even in Joe Biden's America. I'll tell you what ruined the NBA All-Star game. But we start by doing the Trump shakedown. Yes, we are here in Trump shakedown land. And it's been kind of an interesting week or so. But the new news today is this new presidential list poll ranks Biden as the 14th best president. And Trump is, of course, guess where? Last. Yeah, what a surprise. I know I'm shocked that the liberal historians would put him there and put Joe Biden at 14th. And you might say 14th, that's way too high for Joe Biden. That's terrible for Joe Biden when it comes to this particular list. A a guy who's running for president currently needing to be reelected for the liberal uh, media to get what they want. And these historians put him 14th. Like 14th is, I would say, five slots lower than I thought it was possible for him to be in an election year running against Donald Trump. I got to say 14th is about as bad as Joe Biden could have possibly shown up on this list. Uh, Barack Obama, for any point of reference, is seventh. Barack, yeah, the guy you remember from like a few years ago, he was seventh on the list. Comical. A new poll of historians coming out on President's Day weekend ranks Mr. Biden as the 14th best president in American history, just ahead of Woodrow Wilson, who they put 15th on this list. Ronald Reagan is 16th and Ulysses S. Grant is 17th. Comical. While that may not get Mr. Biden a spot on Mount Rushmore, it certainly puts him well ahead of Trump, who put places dead last as the worst president ever. I mean, the list is... We could honestly do the entire monologue of the list. It's so incredibly dumb. A couple of things I will mention, though. Woodrow Wilson, yes, 15th, but falling. We've done some good things when it comes to Woodrow Wilson. I think he's down five slots. So hopefully sometime in the future, they will recognize how bad he is. Uh, but we've still got time on that one. Of course, Donald Trump is coming off of a giant, giant payment he owes, apparently, to the state of New York. $355 million in his New York fraud case. If you remember this story, of course, it's a story about whether he mispriced his real estate to get better interest rates. I mean, $355 million is such an absurd penalty for this uh, uh, theoretical infraction that it's almost beyond the realm of normal you know, world expectations. I mean, it's like these are normally you have a small fine for something like that if and only if someone, some party is harmed. Of course, in this particular situation, no one was really harmed. The banks got these estimates from Trump. They checked out, did their own homework, decided he was still worth the risk, gave him the money, and he paid it back. It's a very boring story, but it's not about that. Of course, this is about hurting Donald Trump. It's about shaking him down. A New York judge on Friday ordered former President Donald Trump to pay $355 million in penalties in a civil fraud case that has dealt a stark blow to his family's business empire with interest. The, the, the uh, figure Trump and his business must pay could surpass $450 million, according to the New York Attorney General's office. The fine is some $16 million less than the $370 million the Attorney, General, uh, Attorney General's office asked the judge to force Trump to pay. It also blocks Trump from participating in New York business for three years. Wow, they saved a big $16 million there, boys and girls. That's so, so insanely generous. Trump's adult sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, were ordered to pay more than $4 million each and were both barred from serving as officers or directors of any New York corporation or any legal entity for two years. Now, the big uh, you know, nine-digit number gets all the attention here, but saying you're taking the top three people out of this country, uh, company is maybe a bigger issue, right? Trump has always been a, tr- a family company. Taking him out is kind of a, a big deal. His two sons as well. And you know what this means? This means CEO and President Tiffany Trump. It's right around the corner. I can't wait for it. Poor Tiffany, I feel like, gets a shaft. She should be out here uh, running the company now. I don't know if she has any exp- any uh, you know experience in this particular field, but 
she's deserved this one thing this one time. I don't think Ivanka wants anything to do with it. So I think it's Tiffany time. Let's get it over to Tiffany, get this thing rolling. Former Chief Financial Officer Alan Weiselberg was offered uh, order to pay $1 million. Weiselberg was also blocked from New York business for three years. And both he and former controller Jeffrey McConney were barred from li- for life for serving in the financial control function of any New York corporation or business entity. Of course, the question remains, why on earth would you want to be in charge of any company in New York after seeing this happen? Now, Kathy Hochul uh, immediately came to the front and was like, I, I, every business, every other business will be fine. This is just a Trump thing. We swear. Don't want to scare away all the billionaires from New York. But wouldn't you be scared away if you were a billionaire? I know we have a lot of billionaires who watch this show. So, you know, do you feel like maybe you'd want to bring your corporation to another state? I mean, we just saw Elon Musk move from Delaware to Texas. Uh, This is happening. uh, And I think these blue states that think they're making all their points by taking on business people are going to reap the rewards of this treatment of billionaires and multimillionaires later on as we go uh, forward. But we'll see how that plays out. The judge in the independent monitor uh, uh, said the independent monitor he installed to oversee Trump's businesses would continue operating for three years in addition to the installation of an independent director of compliance. Basically, anything they can do to hurt Donald Trump at this point, they're going to do. Uh, This is, of course, they would also do a lot of the stuff to any Republican who happened to get the nomination. But Trump is kind of easy pickings for the media and the left. There is a good chunk of the country that already hates his guts. They don't feel bad for him no matter what you do to him. So this is sort of like low hanging fruit to just try to bleed him dry financially. Now, of course, the, the political impact here is that anyone who would ever in any world consider voting for Donald Trump has been radicalized by all this. We, we've saw, we saw this happen when the first indictments went on. You know, Donald Trump, we, we kind of have this, I think, retrospective vision of Donald Trump as this, uh, you know, um, uh, a person who could never be taken down by anything. But he was not doing all that well a little, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, a year to a year and a half ago. Following January uh, 6, a lot of stuff happened. People kind of turned away, especially, you know, Republican borderline voters in the suburbs were like, I don't know, I don't really like them. They didn't really embrace them in 2020 and decided they kind of wanted to go another direction until we get that turnaround with the indictment. And people said, wait a minute, this is crazy. They're just going after this guy and trying to take him out of the race completely. It wound up bringing people back to Trump. You could argue it backfired. Depends on your perspective on that. Some people think uh, that, you know, look, they wanted to put him in control of this nomination because they think he's beatable. Uh, So far, that's not playing out. We may do this later in the week about Donald Trump's current polling position uh, because it's pretty good. Uh, In fact, it's as good as it's ever been uh, when it comes to his version against Donald Trump. Now, all that happened, you know, it's completely transparent about what they're doing right now to Donald Trump. They want to take this guy out by any means necessary. And lawfare is their chosen weapon of choice right now. Uh, And it's look, it is sometimes look, Trump can be uh, the type of candidate that that does everything he can to be to show his bluster and to try to tie himself to voters. He does this all the time. You know, if they're coming after me, they're coming after you. But it is something to kind of take seriously when you sit back and you think uh, these people will do anything to stop someone in their way. Now, you may never get in their way. You may be just a normal voter, just a normal business owner, just a normal person. But you saw what that meant during COVID, right? You got in their way by keeping your business open. And they did everything they can to, to, to make your life miserable. This is something that is real in this country. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly um, what you're seeing in other countries, but it's reminiscent of some of those other countries. And, and that's disturbing. Now, look, Donald Trump has a couple different Uh, ways he relates to us as human beings here, conservatives, citizens of this country. Number one, we look at him as a fellow citizen, right? A person who built a very large business empire and wound up being president of the United States, but is still just a citizen. And the apparatus of this country should not be weaponized to harm him. From that perspective, it's very easy to look at this and say, wait a minute, this is completely wrong. And uh, what they're doing to him is horrific. Of course, when it comes to his, the personal impact of a decision like this, 
it's not as impactful as the criminal proceedings might be. The criminal proceedings are something that has an effect uh, 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 on us as uh, citizens and voters under a potential President Trump or a potential President Biden in 2024. When it comes to the election, this one honestly probably doesn't affect things all that much. It's a bunch of money, and I feel for him as an individual. But again, he's told us a million times he's got $10 billion. Uh, If they take uh, $350 million, which likely they will never get, Um, He will likely appeal this and it'll probably be reduced at some point. It doesn't make it any more fair. It doesn't make it any more just. But if he actually does have $10 billion, financially, he'll be able to deal with this. Donald Trump's not going to he's not going to be staying in any Motel 6s anytime soon. I stayed at the uh, Trump International in Vegas when we were out there for the Super Bowl. Very nice, by the way. You, you, you'd probably like it. Uh, if you're ever out there, it's kind of nice. It's, a little, it's off the strip a little bit. No casino in it, so it's kind of a calm sort of a respite from the rest of the world. You're within walking distance of a resorts world and, uh, you know, so it's maybe a 10-minute walk to resorts world. Uh, so you can get all the bells and whistles over there. I don't know. It was kind of nice to step out. And I would say when you're in in, uh, in uh, Vegas, it's, it's a place to check out. You, you might like staying there, especially if you, you know, if you maybe have a spouse that's not all that into gambling, it's kind of nice. You have a nice little place to step, you know, step aside. You can get into the restaurant. It's not too, too hard. Very nice rooms, nice service, as, as you'd expect. So anyway, that's my little recommendation for uh, Trump International uh, in Vegas. Now, this is only affecting the New York uh, wing of this business. Uh, it's going to cost them a lot of money. You know, you feel bad for him as a person, but probably won't redirect the country's um, uh, future leadership all that much. I don't think anyone's like, wow, he got fined. Now I'm not going to vote for them. I I don't know who that person is. Maybe that person exists. I've never met him. I don't know if you have. But most people are looking at this as what it is. You know, Letitia James ran for uh, to, to I mean, she ran on a platform specifically to go get Trump. She eventually wanted to run uh, on the same platform for uh, running for governor. Uh, it was get Trump, get Trump, get Trump, get Trump. That's just the way that she was doing it. Letitia James takes a Trump verdict victory lap after her often bizarre five year war of words with Trump. Very, very strange. Now, I will say this uh, about uh, our friend Letitia James. And, and I will say most people don't like Letitia James. Uh, especially on the conservative side. I have a very, very small, warm feeling in my heart for Letitia James for this particular reason. This, of course, is my framed picture of Andrew Cuomo resigning. And look, I'm not going to say I like Letitia James, but there's a tiny, like, do you ever have that? Do you have a relationship with, like, maybe a, a girlfriend from high school and you had a bad breakup, but you have a couple of moments you think back to warmly? That's kind of how I feel with Letitia James. Never thought she was good. Definitely thought she was doing things that were probably unconstitutional and illegal and awful. But also this, I mean, she was largely responsible for getting Andrew Cuomo out. So I have a little bit of a warm feeling, just a little bit, but... You lose that feeling quickly when you watch a statement like this, which is about as bad a performance as you will ever see from a public speaker. I mean, you want to talk about someone. I don't know if she's trying to get into the next, into Hamilton or what. The drama is so thick on this one. But check it out. Today, justice has been served. served. Today, we prove that no one is above the law. No one. No matter how rich, rich powerful, powerful, or politically connected you are, everyone, everyone must play by the same must rules. Play by the same rules. We How have a responsibility to protect the integrity this? of the marketplace. Oh, the marketplace. Yeah, for years, you care about that. Donald Trump engaged in deceptive business practices and tremendous fraud. <laughs> Donald Trump falsely, knowingly, inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself, his family, family. and to cheat the system. Cheat. The system. Donald Trump may have authored the art of the deal, but he perfected the art of the steal. <laughs> that is so bad. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about a horrible, perfected the art of the steal. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, I don't know if she thought she was in like some Queen of England role in some terrible movie, but I is really freaking embarrassing, honestly, by Letitia James. Uh, But this is what she ran on. This is what the people of New York wanted her to do. They wanted her to go after Donald Trump by any means necessary. Take the man out. And they're going to try to suck a nine-figure sum out of him. Um, You know, you know, like... 
in a way, you see this from other countries. Other dictators do things like this. They throw out their political opponents. I mean, you know, like there's lots of comparisons with Vladimir Putin. Uh, look, you, the, nobody in this country is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is a pretty unique individual uh, uh, at this point. And, you know, he's, he's killing Navalny. He's doing all sorts of terrible things. He's invading countries. He's causing mass chaos all over the world. Look, it, there's no comparison. But there is a comparison as far as Direction. We don't need uh, Joe Biden to be Vladimir Putin uh, to say that he's bad. Uh, he is he is bad. He's doing things that other dictators try to do. You know, you you hear this. Um, you hear this thing about rigging elections. And you know how I feel about that. Like, I think it's a lot of excuse making, frankly, uh, that usually comes up on this. But like when your opponent is trying to kick you off the ballot, is rigging the worst word for that? I mean, I. I don't know if you're alone on the ballot. What kind of democracy is that? I know you have to face off against the Green Party candidate and everything. But generally speaking, like you're trying to throw your candidate who is your opponent off the ballot. I, it feels a little rigged. I guess they would say it's not a fraudulent rigging, which would set it apart. But like if you went in and you were just like, well, you know, we're going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, well, you know what? We got them thrown out of the game. And now we're going to take our Super Bowl ring because they didn't show up. That's kind of rigging the Super Bowl if you're not actually playing against another team. Kind of seems basic. I and mean, I can't even imagine what would happen, obviously, if the Republicans were doing that. And we, we actually don't have to imagine it. We can kind of remember uh, what, how it was treated when it occurred. Because back in the day, there was a call for the Repu- by some Republicans to remove President Obama from the ballot. You remember the whole birther thing? Well, this was laughed out of society. I mean, the, the, the media mocked it every chance they got. In fact, they brought it up constantly to try to paint Republicans as being erratic. That wasn't even a serious attempt at it. There was never a chance that Barack Obama was not going to be on the ballot. And yet it was treated as if it was the worst thing that anyone had ever done. And here we are. They've got courts. This, this isn't Internet sleuths. These aren't you know, people who are out there on the Internet tweeting, tweeting away or Xing away tweet storms uh, saying, oh, I swear, you know, I, I have this evidence on, on Barack Obama's birth certificate. This is a real attempt by judges to throw one of the two people off the ballot. It's, it's insanity. Um, now, of course, AOC had to get involved in this. She's taking credit for it. Uh, AOC's questions years ago helped spark the investigation into Trump's business. Now he's been ordered to pay $355 million. Ah, look, you want to talk about narrative building. Obviously, AOC's PR people are hard at work to get headlines like that. I, mean, I think everybody knew that Donald Trump said a lot of things that inflated uh, his worth and importance in the, in the world. He basically said every hotel he's had. Look, Trump International, I just told you it's a nice hotel. It's not the greatest hotel in the world. It's fine. It's nice. It's solid. If you're out in Vegas, eh, you might want to take a, uh, take a couple of nights there. But is it the best? No. Uh, he inflates that. He inflates everything about everything that he owns. And everyone knew that going in. AOC's questions, I don't think, were particularly germane to this investigation. Uh, now, they're going to try to pay with... This is going to be a, a tough one. A GoFundMe to pay for Trump's legal fees. I, he's apparently uh, his, he's already spent $50 million in a year on legal fees. And I got to tell you, it sucks because you know, he can use this money to fight a presidential race. Instead, he's diverting it to his legal expenses. This was one of the criticisms of him in the, in the primary uh, and probably a valid one. The question is, can he overturn the negatives associated with having to spend giant chunks of money uh, on legal funds, in, uh, legal fees instead of funding his campaign? Uh, of course, uh, his answer to that partially is selling cool shoes. Uh, here they are. Uh, the, I mean, they're not for me. Uh, but maybe some people would like these. Trump's high tox, top sneakers sell out hours after launch. And like I heard kind of a little bit of both on this. Was Donald Trump booed or cheered at the shoe conference? Uh, you make the call. Here he is at the shoe conference. Wow. A lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotion in this room. Thank you. Thank you. So nice. So the really nice thing is we have lines, and I want to thank Chase, and I want to thank Alan. But we- All right, so there you go. Um, you might say, okay, I think he was booed. But actually, let me give you another clip from the same shoe conference. <laughs> so 
So I don't know. The answer is, was he booed or was he cheered? The answer, of course, is yes. Uh, both, apparently. Uh, President Trump's official sneaker. Uh, you could buy it now, only a thousand pairs, but he did sell them out at 399 bucks a pop. Now, uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, at least TikTok is showing that Biden is also selling shoes. His, however, look like this. Uh, black leather Velcro with Biden Harris on the side. <laughs> I don't know. I think he really should actually sell those. He should just lean into the old thing at this point. Just be like, yeah, I'm a thousand years old. I don't know if I'll make it through. You know, uh, who knows? Probably not. But I'll be better. I swear. Look at these shoes. They're really fancy and comfortable for long walks. I have an announcement to make today. And I just want to end this uh, today because I've been watching all the coverage of Donald Trump and all of the money uh, flying around as they try to suck him dry. And I just want to say at this time, I have not told you this before, but I was at a Bergdorf Goodman dressing room in 1987 and I was assaulted by Donald Trump. And you should give me $83 million. Uh, so I will feel much better about that. And if he talks about it again, maybe 100, 355 more. I don't know. Uh, just remember this next time they're handing out money in New York. I'm sh- pretty sure I remember a really bad incident at Bergdorf Goodman that happened not too long ago. And it's, it's really scarring me. So send me nine figures or at least a few free nights at Trump International Hotel. You know, we started this this show today with the list of presidents. And you might think to yourself, well, how do how do we get the education system back on track after it's obviously I mean, if if historians think that Woodrow Wilson is the 15th best president and Joe Biden is the 14th and Ronald Reagan is 16th, Barack Obama is 7th. We have completely lost the plot when it comes to American history. And that's why I'm so glad that Hillsdale College exists. Time and technology have changed a lot of things, but they have not changed the basic fundamental truths about the world and our place in it, and the fact that Woodrow Wilson sucks. That's why I'm excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and the fall of the Roman Republic, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses. They're all available for free. That's right. If you're a historian and don't know which presidents you should rank near the top of a list, go take some free courses at Hillsdale. Maybe you'll learn something. Calvin Coolidge is somehow like in the 30s. This is insanity. The courses are self-paced so you can start wherever and wherever, uh, whenever and wherever you want. Get started today at hillsdale.edu slash stew. Hillsdale.edu slash stew. It's free. It's easy to get started. It's hillsdale.edu slash stew. Check it out now with Hillsdale College. E- Hildale, hillsdale.edu slash stew. Really happy to be joined by comedian Jeff Allen. He's the author of Are We There Yet? My Journey from Messed Up to a Meaningful Life, which is available now wherever you get your books. Make sure you go out and get it. I mean, Jeff is a really, really funny guy, if you don't know Jeff. Uh, Jeff, wow. welcome to the program. Nice to be back. Yeah. Uh, nice. So it's been how many years since I've been? I, it's know, been a long time. I'm I was glad just... you dropped the charges and yeah. finally like, come back. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, eventually uh, those those borders where you can go shrink and, right. uh, you know, you're, you're yeah. fine. Um, you... Uh, you are very, I mean, messed up life uh, doesn't exactly capture it completely. Like, you had definitely had uh, your moments where things were a little dark and you went down some some tough roads. I mean, that's part of what's really interesting about your story is that, like, I think people get to the point where you were and feel like it's over. Like, they are screwed right. and they can never turn it around. How did you well, go Well, it doesn't help that story? when you get down to that point, everybody around you tells you you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, That's awful. I just uh, crawled into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, as beat up and broken as you would imagine you'd be, and they said, pray. I said, to what? And that was the journey. It was, okay, if God exists, then what does that look like? Yeah. Or is it true? And uh, I went through, I never read a book in my entire life, and all of a sudden I became this vociferous reader. I mean, I just read everything I could get my hands on to try to find some point to anything. And... Um, you know, after seven or eight years, I met some guy on the road. He put the Bible in my hands of all the books. I, I tell people all the time, the bookstores are full of thousands of books of man's attempt to find meaning apart from God. Mm. 
and the Bible hasn't changed in 2,000 years. You know, it just sits there with dust all over it. And, and uh, it was the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the, the first verse says, meaningless, meaningless, all in life is meaningless. And I said, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're speaking I mean, directly it was. to me. My wife was leaving me. I, had, I mean, it was, just, it was just the perfect time to hear that. And I, to me, that was such a deep, profound truth. I was a nihilist at that point. Yeah. And uh, when a nihilist hears it's, it's all a waste of time, you go, yes, it is. And then uh, later on in the chapter, uh, Solomon talks about um, the uh, eyes never get enough of seeing, the ears never get enough of hearing. In other words, you'll never see enough or hear enough to satisfy and sate whatever that is inside of us. So uh, I'm looking at my video library, my audio library, and going, that's true. So I felt if, if that stuff was true, then other things in it must be true. Yep. And, and eventually I just got to Christ and the cross and thought, okay, I'm, I'm yours if it's true then it will last. If it's not, then it'll just be another one of many. I mean, I tried Buddhism. I, you, <laughs> I wanted to raise the, the kids <laughs> Buddhist. I came home one day and I, you know, I had a reason. Tammy goes, I said, I'm, raised, I'm putting the kids in a Buddhist monastery. She says, over my dead body. And I went, oh, okay. That's how long it took her to talk me <laughs> out of it. But I said, I said, look, I'm a rage freak. My brother was a rage mm -hmm. freak. My dad was a rage freak. I got two boys. I don't want them to be like me. Yeah. And when's the last time you heard about a Buddhist rage, road rage incident? You know, <laughs> they're not exactly out there you know, yeah. running their cars into, right. into stores yeah. you know, because they're irritated. So mm -hmm. anyway, I had You don't a see a lot of Buddhist monks driving at all. Not at really. all. It's not just not their thing. Doing a whole lot. Um, so uh, take people back to how you got to this low point, because you were part of like the stand up comedy revolution. Like you were right in the middle of. Yeah, I started at 78. So by 1980, there were more clubs than there were comedians. And I yeah. always said I got a chance to go out and be bad at something and make a few bucks. Right. Until I learned some craft. But yeah, I was living in Boston, which in the 80s. Outside of maybe San Francisco was the hottest place in the country Huge. to do comedy. Mm -hmm. And I was really blessed and fortunate. I mean, you could do five shows in one club on a Saturday night. They had a huge room upstairs, about 400 people, and then downstairs they sat about 250. You would Jeez. just go up and down the stairs to, to, to work. And uh, one of the stories I tell in the book was I got, I got out in the car, I was doing some cocaine for the ride home, and some cop raps on the window. and pulls me out and cuffs me and they're putting me in a cruiser and a policeman off duty who was working security at the club looks at me and goes, oh, what's, what are you doing with him? He goes, oh, I was doing cocaine. And the off duty cop goes, oh, let him go. He's one of the comedians as if that's a get out of jail. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, it turned out it was. Wow. They took me out, uncuffed me and the uh, cop looked at me and said, you, are, you have no idea how lucky you are. The DA is up for reelection. And they love nothing more than parading white suburban boys in front of the camera right before the election. Mm. So anyway, uh, that was like one of the, uh, and then I was driving the wrong way on the interstate one night so drunk, you know. And, ah, that's scary. And then I, I, went, I went after my six-month-old son one night. He was crying and I spanked him. And um, Tammy took him away from me and sat on the end of the bed and fed him. And that was, that was it for me. That was the, the most humiliating thing I could think of ever doing. Yeah. I mean, uh, so anyway, I told her, you don't take me to this, this meeting tomorrow. I'm not going to go. And if I don't go, I don't think we're going to make it. So she took me to AA and that started the whole thing, man. It was just this uh, thing about seven or eight years of just constantly going, you know, what's the, what's it all? What's the point? You know, they'd say higher power. And I go, look, if I'm making up a deity, that makes me delusional. I mean, it's a nice fuzzy thing, you know, like a bumper sticker, you sure. know, until life happens. You get death of a child, the loss of a job, cancer or something, and you're on your knees trying to find some comfort, and your brain's chirping at you. What are you who are you talking to? Right. You know, yeah. It's not real. So anyway, that was, yeah. you know, that was it. I think it's like portrayed a lot of times, you know, a lot, the, the story of, of, of a dark, dark place and a turnaround even through God is, is a story that people have gone through, obviously. This is a big part of the, of, of the church and, and why people go to it. But like it's often presented as this like moment, right, where you you go from dark to light. Yeah, and now I'm fixed. Yeah, and now that's I'm not fixed. even close. It's not. You, so no. this took a lot of work after. And you I'm had still. This I mean, believe me, the uh, the Bible's clear. Paul talks about it. The, we have old nature, and we and then you you say to I want the Holy Spirit, whatever. Yeah. 
That's your new nature. So you got this thing warring. I mean, and believe me, I, I'm, I'm not holding myself up. I don't, yeah. I don't want the NSA going through my, <laughs> my stuff. Man. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, I have a major work in progress. Sure. And I said, I have to be careful now mm. because of all the exposure that I've been getting online and stuff. Now right. people are recognizing me. So yeah. I told my wife, now I can't even throw a fit at the airport because <laughs> I'll, I'll go viral. Right. Christian comedian. Yeah. That's why it was funny. We, mm. Every time we would watch... Um, uh, survivor. Mm -hmm. Tammy says, "Oh, you'd be perfect. I can yeah. see it. You know, two days without food, your blood sugar drops. And now you're choking other. Con and That's right below it, it says Christian comedian. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Jeff Allen. Jeff Allen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny because that 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 uh, that journey for a lot of people like has so many ups and downs. It's not even a smooth. Not at all. You know, and I think like I, mean, I think about this in in." in in uh, politics, I know how closely yeah. you follow politics too, and you know the in the country is not like this straight line story of freedom, right? Like the world as it is, right. errs towards the side of despotism and authoritarianism, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, just like we naturally sort of err toward the side of of being terrible human beings, <laughs> right? Um, and if you're not constantly trying to bring yourself back to the Bible or from a political sense, the Constitution. You can get lost really quickly. Well, I have five questions I put in the book that I, I visit at least monthly in my life really? as an assessment. Uh -huh. um, what defines me? Most men will give you a vocation. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, then you're basically a victim to your circumstances. You lose your job, you lose your vocation, you lose your meaning and your point and mm -hmm. compass to life. Um, so what defines me is, uh, you know, Sartre, uh, before he died, um, came to a conclusion. He said that his his... His philosophy was unlivable, existentialism. Mm -hmm. um, he said in order for something finite to have meaning, it has to be attached to something infinite and fixed. Now, he would never say God. He was an atheist, but mm -hmm. that sounds like God. So anyway, sure does. so what defines me, uh, what do I value? Um, I used to look around and wish I had stuff, uh, things, material, and uh, I want to be a man of integrity. I really do. I want to integrate what I believe with how I live. Mm -hmm. And that's the struggle because there's, uh, without a standard, then you're, you're, you are an existentialist. You're just you know, following your passions. Right. And that got me to the gutter. Uh, what are my expectations? Um, you know, that I tell my wife all the time, if you would lower your expectations of me, I would meet them and you'd be a lot happier. <laughs> right. and this you know, is your fault. Right. right yeah. But expectations, very important. What voices do you listen to? You know this. Yeah. It's a very noisy culture. Mm hmm so what you choose to put in, your, your mind and your heart, it will come out at some point. So pay attention to the voices you listen to. I still, to this day, I, we have friends that watch CNN and MSNBC. And I, I mean, I sat down with them, tried to have a serious conversation with them. I said, two years they perpetuated a lie about Trump. Hmm. Two years, night after night. This doesn't bother you? This doesn't force you to at least Re-examine your exactly. viewing choices. The credibility of <laughs> yeah, the information yeah. you're getting. You mm. know? So anyway, what voices do you listen to? And then where does your hope lie? Mm. Um, if your hope is in the next election, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, yeah. No I kidding. really do. No kidding. And, um, and, uh, and again, I, I, I read, wrapped up in the 90s. I talked to Glenn about this. I said I was never more miserable in my life. You know, and I, I was working with a guy. I tell this story in the book. I'm working with a guy in an AA thing. And he says, uh, I said, I'm so miserable, man this sobriety thing, and he goes, how much news do you watch? And this was before Fox. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, not much, six, seven, eight hours a day. I, mean, I was just <laughs> yeah, out in the hotel room. Yeah. It was CNN, headline news. Yeah. And he said, uh, he was in uh, South America. The Pope was there. And, uh, you know, he's backslidden Catholic. He says, well, who doesn't want to see the Pope? So anyway, he goes out, sure. quarter of a million people. One time the Pope says, let's get on our knees and pray. He said, most profound experience I've ever had, certainly in a religious sense. Mm. He said something washed over that entire place. So I go back to my room that night and CNN covered the 15 protesters that were calling the Pope the Antichrist. <laughs> and he sure, said, I realize yes. the camera is just that big. It's yeah. myopic. And mm -hmm. whatever that news director chooses, and you got a paradigm that's 24 seven, if it bleeds, it leads. So what can go wrong with pumping that into your soul seven nights a week, you know? Yeah. So it takes some time. You know, I, I try to tell my grandchildren, I go, you live in the greatest time in the world. I mean, the Internet, you can bring in lectures from some of the greatest minds that God has ever produced. Or you can just sit and play, you know, 
animal farm or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? No, it's true. I mean, you, I, I, you have the choice to sit down and edify and, and, and fill your soul with something that may benefit yourself and mankind, consequently mankind, you hope. I see it with Glenn. I mean, Glenn, you know, obviously he's been sober for a long time, but like he, he has those battles with the news where he gets so into those worlds of right. it's just darkness, right? And he yeah. I, he struggles, I think, to stay on top of it. When I when we when we had dinner one night, I said to him, I go, "What was it like at Fox when you kick over a rock?" Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> you know? that's what it seemed to me. Yeah, as a viewer, I had just heard of him, and yeah. I'm watching this, and like every night we would sit down, and it was like, "Holy cow!" Yeah, you know, I did, and then it leads here, and it's like, "Oh, it's it's been going on all these tentacles." And you can get in it. Uh, I got into it with apologetics for, for my faith. I wanted to learn sure. how to defend my faith. Mm -hmm. And a pastor saw me reading, uh, I think it was a Ravi Zacharias book, and he said, uh, you like that? I go, I, I, yeah, I, f I feel the need in the world I'm in, the secular world, mm -hmm. you know, you should have an answer. Yeah. You know, and he said, be careful. I, he goes, I went down that rabbit hole for 19 years. And uh, he said, there's always questions. He said, in the end, it's really a leap of faith. I mm. mean, you, at some point, you're going to have to just accept the fact that you don't know everything. Mm. And um, it was about three years after that it hit me. I mean, I was on my 37th book, and I'm going, I'm, it's just getting circular. Yeah. It's just this constant thing back, you know, so... So you're a quick learner. It only took you three years after that moment to, to pick it up. <laughs> to pick up the fact that yeah. I'm never going to know. Right. I, I, you know, that's, yeah. I, I said to a friend of mine that's an atheist, I said, why don't you shoot for agnosticism? You know you don't know. How right? about that? Yeah, yeah. there you go. Just, We're going to agree. Yeah, yeah, like, just yeah, go there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. Um, yeah. Well, look, your journey's really been uh, one I know has inspired a lot of people. And uh, you know, the book is, is there for people who are maybe going through this or just want to be entertained because, of course, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, and it, 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 I believe that uh, it's, it's, I wrote it for 30-somethings, millennials. Um, mm. uh, I'm working right now with a pastor here to bring Ecclesiastes to my Facebook page uh, because I think it's so relevant. Uh, you get to be 30 to 40 years old, you got the wife, you got the house, you got the car, you got all this. And that was what I went through because, you know, people go, why are you so miserable? I go, I don't know. I checked the boxes. I had a beautiful yeah. wife. I had healthy children, job I loved, you know, and, you know, we were struggling financially, but that was because I was spending more than I was bringing in mm -hmm. to try to salve this wounds. So anyway, um, uh, there's an answer to all of this, but um, it's, um, it, it takes thought, it takes an effort. Um, what it's, uh, Aristotle, no, it's Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living, you know? And I almost called it an examined life mm. because that was a, a period of my life that was, I was just constantly. So the negative side of that is that you're never available for your family because you're constantly in your head. In your own head, yeah. You know, and she's shaking me, you know, we're losing the house, you don't care. I go, I don't. She goes, who says that? I go, someone who doesn't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I want to care. Yeah. I just didn't know why it mattered. Ah, wow. Well, it's yeah. an incredible journey. Are we there yet? My journey from messed up to meaningful life. It's from Jeff Allen. Available now wherever you get your books. Make sure to pick up a copy today. Jeff, thanks so much. Great to see you. Man. Thanks, man. Yeah. Let me go through some incredibly stupid stories from the world today. Kenny Smith uh, is one of the broadcasters who was covering the All-Star uh, weekend. And there was this pretty fun contest they did, sort of uh, man versus woman and the three-point contest. Steph Curry uh, going against uh, Sabrina Ionescu, uh, who I'm not familiar with, but I'm sure is wonderful. Uh, and they, they did a three-point contest from the th NBA three-point line. And Curry uh, beat her 29 to 26 was the final score. After the, uh, which is close. I mean, she did pretty well. Um, after the contest, uh, this is what uh, how the Athletic describes it. The simple problem with Kenny Smith's comments on TNT during the best moment of All Star Saturday was that they didn't make any sense. Okay, this is what didn't make any sense. He said she should have shot from the women's line. That would have been a fair contest. I mean, all of her games are played when she's shooting from the women's line. Wouldn't it make sense for her to also shoot from the women's line? When they, uh, someone pushed back on this, uh, Smith kept going, adding, she should have shot from the women's line. There's a women's tee in golf, and there's a men's tee for a reason. That didn't make any sense, according to The Athletic, because that's a crazy... Now, look, they, it was a close matchup. I mean, she wanted to shoot from there. Fine, let her shoot from there. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was an unfair uh, competition. And you know who else is unfairly matched up against Steph Curry at a three-point contest? All other human beings. Steph Curry's the best shooter of all time.
So almost anyone but a beater. But it's not at all a crazy point to say, I don't know, she should shoot from the place that her league has her shooting from, which would maybe make it more natural of a contest. Not a bad comment at all. Another one that is not a bad comment at all is uh, the Kansas City, uh, the Kansas governor, uh, who he's being called racist now by the Kansas City mayor because he called the mass shooters in the Super Bowl parade thugs. And thugs is a loaded word. Actually, the guns were the thing that we were worried about being loaded. Uh, not the word, thugs. It appropriately describes uh, a couple of teenagers uh, shooting, uh, having a gun battle in the middle of a large crowd and almost killing a bunch of children. So, thugs, completely appropriate. And finally, John Oliver is offering Clarence Thomas $1 million a year to resign from the Supreme Court in his latest uh, boring stunt at the end of his, one of his monologues. Um, just to show how stupid this is, the whole case against Clarence Thomas, which is BS, complete BS, but the whole case is that he's living such a wonderful and charmed life with all of his billionaire friends being bribed or whatever they're accusing him of this week, that he has so much money and is, is going on these expensive trips and blah, 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 blah. Well, why would he take it? Why would he leave the Supreme Court for a million dollars a year if he was leave, if he was living this actual uh, charmed existence? And I got news for you. Clarence Thomas could walk out of the Supreme Court today and go to any one of 500 com uh, uh, companies or 100 different think tanks and make a million dollars a year for not even showing up. He doesn't need your stupid bribe to get him off the Supreme Court, but that's what passes for comedy these days. When you have to buy or sell a home, you know it can be a disaster. That's why you need realestateagentsitrust.com on your side. This is Glenn's company. He started it a long time ago because he was tired of dealing with incompetent real estate agents and figured you might be too. Because if you've ever had to buy or sell a home, you know that it sucks. The entire process is a disaster a lot of the time. And look, it's a lot of work. It's confusing. You don't know what's going on. You're just believing people that are reading you things and you're just signing your name and hoping for the best. Look, find the best agent and you find someone who's the best in your area that can work with you. They're the top sellers. They know the lay of the land and the best practices to get you and your family where you need to go, whether it's across the street or across the country. Most of these agents are fans of the show, so you will have something in common with them as well. Do yourself and your family a favor and check them out today. It's realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. Whether you're buying or selling a home, it's a free service to you. It's Real Estate Agents I Trust. Com. Does your wallet feel just a little bit lighter? Uh, it might, after you hear the story. U.S. taxpayers have paid nearly $20 million to maintain a super yacht seized from a Russian oligarch in 2022. What a wonderful expenditure. This includes, by the way, $360,000 a month for the crew. I, you know, as Glenn mentioned this morning, maybe we should be holding a lottery and sending one lucky family to go hang out on the yacht uh, for every week until we at least unload this thing. Uh, $75,000 a month in fuel? I mean, are, are we taking joy rides in this thing? What, what do you mean we're spending $75,000 a month in fuel? Uh, it's really ridiculous, but I want you to think about it this way. This is a better way of thinking about it. April 15th is just around the corner. You're going to be paying your taxes. Think about it this way. Every dollar you will spend on your taxes, for your entire life, combined, probably won't even come close to making a dent in the maintenance fees that our country has paid for a yacht that you will never be able to ride and you didn't even know that we had. That, my friends, is America. When you're watching a Fast and Furious sequel, you have that question, will they make it through? Will Vin Diesel make it through? And then, of course, you kind of know at the end what's going to happen. That's what we're going to try to sell to you this week as we have the South Carolina primary on Saturday. State of the race will be here to give you all the ins and outs and give you more than just who's going to win or who's going to lose, because that one seems like a foregone conclusion at this time. But get it audio only wherever you get your podcasts, the State of the Race podcast on the Stu Does America feed. It's free. Sign up now. we got a new episode coming on Friday.